running through the airport and hurdling things. And well, our plane landed like 10, 15 minutes behind schedule. So we had like three minutes to go about 500 yards. And that was through turns and through all kinds of things to get over to the other uh, airplane. We just made it. They held the plane up for us, so we got over there okay. But uh, incredible things happening in Jamaica. We uh, arrived that Thursday night, and uh, we got settled in. We stayed in a boarding house there, and uh, it was a tremendous time. Friday morning, we got up early, and uh, the first thing that we did when we were there is we went into these high schools. Now, uh, Jamaica's the, the landscape of the whole thing, and, uh, and it's just desolate. There's two types of people there. There's the extremely rich and the, and the people that have money, and then you've got the extremely poor. And so there's no in-between. It's either you're either rich and you have money or you're poor, one or the other, and, uh, or barely making it by the skin of your teeth. And that's, that's going to be what our nation's like if this administration keeps it up. Hallelujah. Extremely rich. There's not going to be any middle class anymore. But what we did is that Friday morning went to high schools. Now, this is going to blow your mind, but we went to two high schools, and each high school we went to was mandatory. They brought all the children out, all the high school students, 300 to 500 kids in each school, brought them out into an assembly area. And, uh, you know, their classrooms are just concrete with bars. They don't have anything in them. And uh, it's just a real uh, incredible scene. You know what? I'm going to go to the hand mic. Peter, put me. Technology is a pain. But we went into these high schools. The first one we went into, there's about 350 kids. And they all lined up, and we began to sing worship songs there. And uh, these kids, I'm going to be totally honest with you, these two high schools were more on fire than most churches are in the United States. And every high school is open to the gospel. We went in there, full liberty. We preached for an hour and a half. We worshiped and we preached the gospel to them. We had multitudes of high school students get saved. It was totally powerful. We had total liberty. The principal and all the teachers were there. They were all worshiping God. They were worshiping. They were testifying. And the kids were coming out of the crowds and singing songs to God. They would come up to the microphone and just begin to sing and worship God. And all the students would get involved. And friends, that's liberty. Can you say amen? You know, if you did that here, we can't even talk to the students now. In the United States, because they're so, this, this, this government won't allow anything, you know, except for passing out condoms. And so these high schools were totally wide open. We went in there, preached the gospel to both high schools. We probably saw 75, 100 kids get saved easy. And uh, it was just a tremendous time, liberty. And so that was Friday morning. And then and, uh, in a couple of weeks, we're going to get a video. We took a lot of video footage. So Pastor Eric Stretch is editing, editing it. And he's putting music to it. And so we're going to have a video to show you of all that happened in Jamaica. Powerful time. So that Friday night, we started our crusade. We had two nights of open air campaigns or crusades in, in, uh, in the local park there, Nelson Mandela Park. This guy's getting around. And how many of you in the United States thinks the guy's a hero? He's a murderer. Hello. But they named this park after him. So that, we thought it was very appropriate to go there and bring life. Hallelujah. And so we went there, had a couple of nights of crusades, up, and uh, a, a whole load of people came out. We probably had about 150 people saved those two nights. We saw major miracles. A woman came up that was having heart problems. She was going to have to have surgery. Her valves were closed. One of her valves was not working at all, and she had a real hard time. And so that was just one miracle. God healed her on the spot. There were many visible miracles that took place there. God was moving them. And uh, there was demon-possessed Rastafarians. How many know what Rastafarians are? Well, there's these dreadlock people, you know, and they were manifesting big time. And, uh, you know, the Rastafarians, you know, in America we have all these white folks that want to be like, you know, the Rastafarian M thing. They don't even know what they're doing. These people over there, they worship a guy called Selassie. I'm, I'm dead serious, and it's not Jim, but they worship, worship a guy called, this guy called Selassie, and, you know, they're into Bob Marley and all of these, and, and it's a real wicked thing. And, you know, we think it's cool over here in the United States, but over there, you see what it really is. It's wicked. Their god is ganja weed, or it's 
pot, it's marijuana, and they worship this guy, and most of them are demon-possessed. And so while we're doing the crusade, we had all kinds of things happen, you know, six foot two people, uh, six foot two tall men walking by totally naked through the crusade, you know, and just moseying them, dude, people naked everywhere, they're just everywhere. And they're manifesting, and we're beginning to set up, and, and while we're beginning to set up, you know, we hear this howling, and these people howling and screaming at the top of their lungs, and these demon-possessed people were just manifesting everywhere. And there was this one lady, she was a, a you know, pretty good-sized lady, and she came up, and she was manifesting, she's demon-possessed before we began to preach, and she started to strip down, and she was going for it. Got it on film. And so it was a crazy time, and we were face to face with these Rastafarians screaming at us, man. They're saying, and, you know, they're saying all kinds of things, hallelujah, about Rasta, Rasta, Rasta. And we're saying the blood of Jesus, hallelujah. And they're just, and they're flipping out, running everywhere. We had such a good time, hallelujah. I mean, I'm telling you, demon possessed people don't look that pretty. They're in your face and one eye is going that way and the other one's going that way and they got dreadlocks and they're <laughs> But Jesus has authority, amen. amen. People got saved, delivered, healed, and that was the first day. And what a break in, hallelujah. You know, people didn't like us, you know, because we're not the, we're different color and the whole thing. But you know what? That was just a demon possessed. The so people really welcomed us there. People came and heard the gospel, got saved those two nights of the crusade and then Sunday morning we started a conference and we went Sunday morning and then Sunday night a couple of services Monday morning Monday night Tuesday Wednesday and so through the whole week we saw a number of people saved up it was the first conference in Jamaica and uh, what, a, what a privilege it was to be able to go there and be able to preach this conference me and the other pastors um, and uh, they launched their first baby church out of that conference hallelujah and to another part of Jamaica at the end of the week we uh, launched Junior and his wife, the man Junior out of that congregation, we launched him into a place called Black River, Jamaica. And uh, what a tremendous time. And they brought another couple on staff. He's got a lot of young people there, friends. They've got this worship leader that's a little over 17 years old uh, that'll blow your mind. He leads the worship services, man, and he is just so on fire and preaching. Um, and all of these young men, they're just totally on fire. And the young women, they're sold out for Jesus Christ. They're, they're not like here. They would, they would, we would be nervous if they were here. Because, man, when they worship, the worship services are so alive. They're just worshiping. And, you know, here people flesh out, you know, and they try to impress. But there it's, a, it's something that's just it's normal to them. Uh, and they do it just because they love God. And we've got footage of the worship services and all of the time that we had there was just a powerful time. And so the church was refreshed. They've got a new vision. They launched their first baby church. And we had a number of things happen while we were there. We had, it was, it was a time, you know, sometimes we think like going over to these crusades is a good time. It's a time where you're just going to go and relax in the Caribbean. And like Pastor Eric said when we got back, he said, that's the hardest I've ever worked on an outreach ever. Because from... Six o'clock in the morning till 12 o'clock at night, we were nonstop ministering, ministering, ministering. And it was a very uh, hard time of work, but it paid off. A lot of people saved them. And uh, the church has a vision and direction. And uh, we just had a tremendous time. And so I really appreciate the investment that you made as a congregation to, to be able to send me over there. And uh, they want us to come back again and do another conference. And uh, we want to plant some more churches in Jamaica. They're going to take the islands for God. Hallelujah. And uh, they got vision, I'm telling you. When you see this video that we're putting together, it'll blow your mind. And uh, they're just totally on fire there. They're sold out for God. They're people just like you and I. We think that they're different, but they're just like you. You know, people everywhere are the same this morning, church. They're the same everywhere. They're in Russia, Jamaica, America. And... Uh, and one of the interesting things is that their attitude towards homosexuals there is totally different than it is here. And, uh, you know, what they do to homosexuals over there is to blow your mind. Is they kill them. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? If they find you a homosexual, they, they take out the citizens. They take out machetes. They take out great big stones. And they stone you and hack you to death. Hello. It was 
quite refreshing to tell you the truth. Hallelujah. Not that I'm into mutilating people or anything, but just the stand that they took against homosexuality. You know, our government told Jamaica, they said, you know what, if you don't start getting, giving equal rights to the homosexuals there, we're cutting off your humanitarian aid. And so the homosexuals here said, oh, great, so we're going to go to Jamaica and march. And so they were going to have this parade march, and they set the whole thing up. And so all the taxi drivers, all the citizens, everybody in Jamaica lined up along the parade route with three to five foot high piles of stones. And so the homosexuals went to, the, gov went to the, the police department. They said, listen, you need to protect us. We need to have an escort. And they said, we're not escorting you. We're going to get killed. And so the march never took place. The parade never took place because they won't put up with that stuff. Hallelujah. I like that. We need to take a stand. Amen. They're not ashamed. They're not afraid. They're not afraid to take stands up. And the only problem is, is our American television is starting to get into Jamaica. It hasn't been there before. And, uh, you know, they're, they're, they've been shielded from all the immorality and all the garbage that's here. You know, that Americans watch on a daily basis. And uh, now they're starting to open up and it's starting to bring all kinds of garbage and trouble into Jamaica. Because, uh, you know, we lead the nations, friends. And so that was a sad point of the situation. The house that we stayed in, they did have a television. And that sucker was on from 6 o'clock in the morning until we went to bed at 1 or 2 in the morning. Just pumping Oprah Winfrey and all of these, Phil Donahue and all these false prophets of the devil. Amen. And uh, so we need to pray for that nation that God has uh, given uh, Pastor Marty and his wife Barbara, have given them a tremendous favor in that country. They've got liberty. They can go into any school, any time and preach the gospel. They, if, we, if we set up on the streets like they did and do a crusade, we'd get arrested because we don't have a permit. They just have total liberty there. It's so refreshing because over there, they think we're free and we think that they're oppressed, friends. They're free and we're oppressed. We can't even preach the gospel on the streets without them, you know, coming and, you know, wanting to arrest you if you don't have a permit. Um, you know, we can't even get into any school, God forbid, try and help the students. But they've got total liberty there. They're in a third world country. It's desolate over there. They live in shacks. They, they live in these aluminum little, all they have is walls. They don't have roofs or anything, a lot of people. And they just live on the side of the roads. But they're on fire for God. Hallelujah. Listen, they'd go from one end of the island to the other on bus just to get to church. And the buses aren't like here, you know, air conditioning, nice seats, everything. They're just, they're, 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 they're trash. And there's like, I got pictures of these buses. They must have 300 people on this little bus. And they're hanging out the windows and hanging out the door and hanging by each other's clothing, going down the streets. And it's a crack up. But these people are committed to Christ. And it was amazing to me, the liberty and the blessing that they have there. And I so enjoyed myself. It was one of the hardest times I've ever had them, as far as laboring, being attacked by mosquitoes, and uh, all kinds of things. And, uh, but I'm telling you something, friends. We had absolute liberty there. We preached. People were saved. Up, and uh, God is going to move wonderfully there. And so... And uh, you know what amazes me is that there's a church there that's thriving and pumping for God because a man and a woman said, we're going to leave all these comforts behind and we're going to do something for Jesus. Hallelujah. There's a thriving church there and it's just a blessing to see what God is doing. And I'm going to give more report as soon as we get the video back and I'll kind of give a narration of the things that are happening and uh, just a tremendous time. So I really appreciate you. Uh, and your investment in getting us there. It was worth every last cent. Hallelujah. And so praise the Lord. First Chronicles 17. I'm going to read the whole chapter this morning. Appreciate you praying for us, man. There was an anointing on those services. It was just absolutely wonderful. First Chronicles 17. And... Uh, Praise the Lord. I appreciate it if you just open up your hearts this morning to the word of the Lord. And uh, we're going to go a little bit past, prepare you already, but praise the living God this morning. Verse 1, now it came to pass when David was dwelling in his house, that David said to Nathan the prophet, see now I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of the covenant of the Lord is under tent curtains. And Nathan said to David, do all that is in your heart, for God is with you. But it happened that night that the word of the Lord came to Nathan saying, 
Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, you shall not build me a house to dwell in. For I have not dwelt in a house since the time that I brought up Israel, even to this day, but have gone from tent to tent and from one tabernacle to another. Wherever I have moved about with all Israel, have I ever spoken a word to any of the judges of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore, thus shall you say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the sheepfold, from following sheep, to be ruler over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you have gone, and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And have made you a name like the name of, great, of the great men who are on the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them, that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. Nor shall the sons of wickedness oppress them anymore as previously. Since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, also I will subdue all your enemies. Thank you, Jesus. Furthermore, I tell you that the Lord will build you a house. And it shall be when your days are fulfilled and when you go to be with your fathers that I will set up your seed after you who will be of your sons and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build me a house and I will establish his throne forever. I will be his father and he shall be my son. And I will not take my mercy away from him as I took it away from him who was before you. He's talking about Saul. And I will establish him in my house and in my kingdom forever, and his throne shall be established forever. According to all these words and according to all this vision, so Nathan spoke to David. Am I still ringing? Can you hear ringing? Okay, praise the Lord. Then King David went in and sat before the Lord, and he said, Who am I, O Lord God? And what is my house that you have brought me this far? And yet this small thing, this is a small thing in your sight, O God. And you have also spoken to your servant's house for a great while to come and have regarded me according to the rank of a man of high degree, O Lord God. What more can David say to you for the honor of your servant? For you know your servant. O Lord, for your servant's sake and according to your own heart, you have done all this greatness in making known all these great things. O Lord, there is none like you. Nor is there any God beside you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. And who is like your people Israel, the one nation on the earth, whom God went to redeem for himself as a people, to make yourself a name by great and awesome deeds, by driving out nations from before your people, whom you have redeemed from Egypt. For you have made your people Israel your very own people forever. And you, Lord, have become their God. And now, O Lord, the word which you have spoken concerning your servant... And concerning his house, let it be established forever and do as you have said. So let it be established that your name may be magnified forever, saying, The Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, is Israel's God. And let the house of your servant David be established forever before you. For you, O oh my God, have revealed to your servant that you will build him a house. Therefore, your servant has found it in his heart to pray before you. And now, Lord, you are God and it promised this goodness to your servant. Now you have been pleased to bless the house of your servant that it may continue before you forever. For you have blessed it, O Lord, and it shall be blessed forever. I want to look at the spirit of obedience this morning. Because how many of you know this is what we need in our hearts in the church? Hallelujah. This is one of the greatest issues that we face in our own Christian life is the area of obedience. And first thing I want to look at in this text is the real battle is within ourselves because there's an error a lot of times this morning on the side of sincerity because a lot of people this morning they feel that if they're sincere about the things of God that they're qualified for the blessing of God and so David in our text is exactly in this place he's sincere about building a house for God but this, this did not qualify him to actually be involved with that part of the blessing of God and a lot of people are right here this morning um, in their walk in, in Christ and with Christ is this error of sincerity. But what's really happening this morning in a lot of lives um, is that people ask the truth to be put aside for the sake of sincerity. And I'll expound a little bit on this. Um, but we ask a lot of times truth to move aside for sincerity. And so we can see this in this generation and especially in the new it's coined as the charismatic movement. How many of you are familiar with 
the charismatic movement. And so this is a movement where charisma and uh, the way that we present ourselves, our sincerity, moving in the gifts of God, moving up in spiritual gifts, up, moving up in, in the Holy Ghost, um, is all, and the blessing of God is all okay based upon our sincerity to move in these things. Uh, but a lot of times in this movement, truth is disregarded and truth is put aside for the sake of show. How many of you can say amen? See, sincerity is not valid in truth today. And sincerity is not valid in following Jesus Christ. In fact, sincerity can be a great hindrance, can be a deadly hindrance, and can be inadequate in the least. And so at least. And so I want to look at something with you because how many of you know not all of our noble desires for God are true and they're right from God. They're not necessarily right. In other words, you can have desires this morning in your heart and you're following desires in your heart that cannot necessarily be right with God. And this is exactly where David was at. How many of you know it was a noble thing for David? I want to build God a house. I'm going to build him, you know, he's never, he's always dwelt in tabernacles. And, and so I want to build him a house. And, and so right here is the issue that you and I face. He was sincere, but his desire was not what God wanted. And so you and I have the capability of doing the same thing that David did. The word sincerity means the quality or condition of being sincere. A sincere feeling or expression. The word sincere is pure, natural unaffected freedom from falsehood or deceit yet emphasizes the depth of feeling it speaks of stressing a convincing expression of feeling openly displayed and so this morning we're talking about sincerity and the error of sincerity and this is the battle that each one of us face within ourselves and so the Bible says this morning that to obey is better than sacrifice to obey God is better than any sacrifice that we could give him. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22, you'll find that. Obeying God's word this morning from your heart and from our hearts is better than any outward form of worship. It's better than any outward form of service to God. And obeying God's word from your heart and obeying God from the heart is far better this morning than any service of sacrifice you could ever give to God. See, Saul's sin, Saul was before David, Saul's sin was that he placed his own perception or conception of what was right above the biblical revelation that God gave him or the truth that God gave him. God told him, I want you to go, I want you to do such and such, and, uh, and, and I want you to go and destroy the Amalekites if you don't know the story. So he said, okay, I'll go. But when he was there, he didn't obey God's voice. He did his own thing. He did what he felt was right. And so God said, because you did that, I am going to strip the kingdom from you. And the Bible says that God said to Saul, he said, when you, you were once small in your own eyes. In other words, there was a time in Saul's life um, that when God spoke to him, he would listen because he was tender hearted. There was a time in Saul's life um, when God spoke to him that Saul would obey his word, uh, that Saul would seek God, um, that Saul would obey and listen to God. And he said, there was a time when you were small in your own eyes. But there came a time, friends, um, when Saul put aside truth. Uh, he put aside his relation to God and the truth of God in his life for what he felt was best and what he felt was right. And that's when God stripped the kingdom from him. Because he moved according to what he felt was right, according to the sincerity of his heart. And God stripped the kingdom from him because of it. And we can see in scripture this morning that this is going to be the sin in the last days uh, that is going to be the focal point. The Bible talks about a final apostasy or falling away that's going to take place um, in the period of time before Jesus comes uh, and the Bible gives us understanding that this is the very sin that's going to carry people away as they're going to walk away from truth for feeling and for feel good ministry and they're going to walk away from truth um, and they're going to begin to follow something that they think is sincere in their hearts and it's going to lead them away from truth and into an apostate place Matthew 24 verses 11 and 24 Bible says that many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Verse 24, it says, For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 
verses 9 through 12. It says, The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. In 2 Timothy 4, chapter 3, chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, the Bible says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires. Listen here. Because they have itching ears, they will heap up or gather to themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears away from the truth, and they will be turned aside to fables. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, it says, But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bringing on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. In verse 3, by covetousness they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time their judgment has been idle and their destruction does not slumber. So we can understand this morning by these scriptures um, that what's going to take place and is taking place as we sit here this morning uh, is there are people who are going away from truth um, and they're going away from hearing truth um, and they're gathering around themselves uh, teachers uh, that are teaching heresy, that are teaching false doctrine according to what their desires are. How many of you know it's easy for people to do this this morning? Because we want to hear what makes us feel good. We want to hear what we think we need to hear. And we want to hear those things that uplift us and make us feel wonderful. But friends, this is the working um, of the spirit of Antichrist um, in the last days. Um, as there are teachers, even now today, friends, um, that are teaching uh, uh, doctrines and heresies that are not truthful. That are not founded in the word of God. Um, and that are denying that, that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. Now listen. Some of you are probably going to get mad at me right here, but I've got to tell you some things. Um, you know the faith movement. How many of you lift your hand if you know what the faith movement is this morning? We're talking about a number of teachers um, going from Benny Hinn, um, going from Kenneth Copeland, um, Kenneth Hagin, um, and all of these men this morning, uh, they, are, they teach heresy in the church. They deny the Trinity. And I've got, a, I've got tapes, I've got documentation. If you've got any question on the matter, I've got them speaking it with their own lips. Uh, and you know what? We will hear these things, and I'll declare to you this morning that they're heretics, and they're not teaching the truth of God. Uh, and multitudes are flocking to them because it makes them feel good to confess something and have your own desires met. You say, well, now you're slamming, you're naming names. Friends, uh, if you don't do this, who's going to know? And I declare to you this morning um, that there are heretics, uh, there are teachers even today, that these men, they deny the living Christ, um, they deny the deity of Christ. Um, and I dare say this morning uh, that even if I preach this to you and I'll show you and I'll prove it to you, you will still listen to those men because you like what they teach. It's quiet in here this morning. Hello? Oh, Benny Hinn, oh, don't, don't slam him. Don't slam Kenneth Copeland. Don't slam these men. Listen to me. They deny Jesus Christ as God incarnate. And they teach that all of you are gods. That's heresy. And it's leading people away from truth because, friends, it feels good to know that you can confess something and have whatever you want. Hello. Hello. You guys are quiet this morning. Have you ever heard anything like this before? You act like you never heard. You're frogs in a hailstorm. Hallelujah. But this is exactly the spirit that's at work in the last days. And so we validate them. We say, oh, well, they're sincere. They prophesy. They give words. And they're such good teachers. That means nothing this morning in the sight of God. Because all of our worship um, and prayer and our praise and the spiritual gifts uh, and the service to God, um, they're all worthless this morning in His sight um, if they're not performed and they're not walked out by an obedience to His righteousness and His standards in our life.
Ecclesiastes chapter 5 verse 1 it says walk prudently when you go to the house of God and draw near to hear rather than to give the sacrifice of fools for they do not know that they do evil Hosea 6 6 says for I desire mercy and not sacrifice and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings Matthew 9 verse 13 go and learn what this means I desire mercy and not sacrifice for I did not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance and Mark, Mark chapter 12 verse 33 says and to love him with all of the heart uh, with all the understanding with all the soul uh, and all the strength uh, and to love one's neighbor as oneself listen to these words this is more than all of the burnt offerings and sacrifices in one more scripture in Micah chapter 6 verse 6 through 8 it says what with what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God shall I come before him with burnt offerings with calves once a year will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams and ten thousands of rivers of oils shall I give my firstborn for my transgression the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul he has shown you O oh man what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justly to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God see listen to me this morning to obey God is better than any sacrifice you'll ever give him to obey what you know, to obey you're following us, and that sincerity can be totally wrong, and the desire can be totally wrong, because we're not in obedience, we're sacrificing instead. See, sincerity can never be a substitute for truth. Sincerity is not what makes the gifts of the Spirit work. How many of you know what I mean? I've had people, I've had a dozen people at least, that I've heard either speaking to me or speaking to somebody else and say, well, listen, you know, my pastor, he just doesn't understand my gifting. My, my, my pastor, he just doesn't understand uh, that, that uh, I'm a good preacher and he ought to let me preach. Oh, that I'm a good singer and he ought to let me sing. Or I'm a good whatever I am and he ought to let me do this because I'm gifted. And you may be sincere in your heart that, yeah, God has really gifted me. But listen to me, friends. Most of those people are not walking right in their life with God. And they want us to put aside truth just for the sake of the sincerity of their desire to flow in the gifts. But sincerity does not validate the gifts of God. See, how many of you know you can be sincere this morning and yet be sincerely wrong? You can be totally sincere and yet be totally off the mark. See, there's many people this morning that are living, they're not living in truth and obedience to God and His will for their life. You hear me this morning because multitudes, they flock to churches and... And, and they're sacrificing to God. They're bringing the burnt offerings. They're bringing the rams. They're bringing the rivers of oil. They're bringing all these things. You know, that's what they're thinking. They're coming to church. They're sacrificing. But they're disobeying the will of God. He said, to obey my voice is better than all the sacrifice that you could ever give me. And so they're not walking in truth. And yet they feel like they're okay. Because they have a sincere feeling about what they're doing. And they have a sincere feeling about what they're doing is right. And I've heard a lot of people, pastor, you know, they'll be, they'll, they'll be totally off the mark. And they say, well, I don't feel wrong. Hello? It's because that sincerity factor in them. They may feel sincerely right about a situation, but they're totally missing the mark. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. In verse 13 through 15, the Bible says, But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. Hallelujah. Verse 14, to which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 15, therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or by our epistle. In Proverbs 23, 23, I've said this verse a lot, buy the truth and do not sell it. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. And so we understand by these scriptures this morning that you and I are called to truth. 
You and I are called to walk in truth. You and I, the Bible never says um, that you and I are called um, to, to do the things that we feel are okay. Um, the Bible says we are called to walk in truth, in the midst of truth, to walk in truth, to uphold truth, um, to buy truth and not to sell it. Can someone say amen this morning? And so the battle is within our heart and within our life this morning is this error of sincerity. Because you can be totally sincere about your sacrifices to God and yet be sincerely wrong in what you're doing. The second thing I want to look at is the true measure of character. Because how many of you know, you and I as humans, our human nature hates to be told no. Can you say amen? Our human nature hates to be told no. In other words, we're going to do something, uh, and we want to do something, and God says, no, you can't do that. We hate that. And human nature is this way, and I've seen this in disciples, um, I've seen this in ministry, I've seen this in people, when they're going a certain direction, um, and they're confronted with a certain direction of their life, or something that's in their life, and they're told, no, you shouldn't be doing this, you can't do this, they lose it. Because human nature cannot stand um, to be told no. Let me ask you something this morning. Um, how well do you receive in your life a denial from God concerning your plans? In other words, you want to do something. You're in a certain direction. And all of a sudden, God comes to you and says no. How well do you receive from God this morning when he says no? You know, we sing this song, I'll say yes. Lord, yes, and we're all hopping and yipping and praise God. But then when it comes down to God saying something, it's not so easy to sing that song anymore, is it? I'll say, oh, man. It's a whole different story. The question is, how well do you receive from God when he tells you no this morning? Because that's the test of true character in Christianity. As yes, we're able to receive when he says yes. But how about when he says no? See, because if we can handle denial, the denial of our most sincere plans. How many of you have ever been really sincere in your heart about doing something for God or doing a certain thing in your life and God has stepped in and said no? Lift your hand. If you can handle denial, the denial of your most sincere desires this morning, without having any bitterness in your life, you have a future in the kingdom of God. Amen. But people who will not be denied, they have no future with God. Because there was a number of times in all of my Christian life where God has come and said, no, 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 no. How many of you know what I'm talking about this morning? And it's in those times where your heart can get bitter and you can get frustrated and you can begin to say, you know what, I'm not going to do that. This is my desire. This is what I want to do. And God says no. And you say, yes, I'm going to do it anyways. You have no future in the kingdom of God. A disciple this morning, hallelujah, is willing to allow God to change his plans. Hallelujah. See, Nathan in our text came to David. David had a wonderful plan to build him. God him. A, a, a house he wanted to build him how many of you know I already stated that was a noble thing um, that was a desire any one of us would say yeah man let's do it even Nathan told him well, do all that's in your heart God is with you Nathan goes home and God said no 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 you go back and tell him I said no so here's Nathan and, and he just told David and David's all jazz you can do it so he comes back and maybe knocks on his door comes in and sits him down says David listen I know I told you that whatever you wanted to do, you could do because God was with you. But God told me last night, don't do this. I don't want you doing this. This was a desire of David. He wanted to do this. Um, and it's not like he wanted to go out and sleep with Bathsheba right here. He was wanting to do something for God, right? It looked a noble thing. Up, and it was a noble task. And Nathan came to him and said, listen, David, God said no. Don't do this. And so the Bible says um, uh, that David had this attitude. It was a positive attitude. Um, he didn't get all bitter and tripped out. In verse 16, um, the Bible says, Then King David went in and sat before the Lord. And he said, Who am I, O Lord? Um, and what is my house that you have brought me thus far? And so here we find um, that David said, 
God, okay, you're God. You can do whatever you want to do in my life. Whatever you want to do, I'll do this. Um, I don't care about the Noah. And the Bible says this critical thing that he went and sat before the Lord after he was told no. Most of the problem with us this morning um, is when God speaks to us, um, especially in the area of denial, we just walk away all bitter instead of going and sitting before the face of God. And when he went and sat before the Lord, he said, Okay, God, um, he said, You're God. How many of you know what a revelation that is this morning? You're God. You're my God. You'll, you can do whatever you want. And so David had the right response to denial. You go back and look at Saul's life. Um, when God told him, I want you to go kill the Amalekites, wipe them out, don't keep anything. Um, and he went and he destroyed all the women um, and the children. He kept a few of them for himself. And he took all the goods, the plunder, it says, and he, get, he kept it for himself. So Samuel heard from God, went back to Saul and said, Saul, you blew it. Just like Nathan went to David said, no. Samuel went to Saul and said, Saul, no, you shouldn't have done this. God told you not to do this. And Saul immediately, he doesn't say, okay, God, you're God. I'll do whatever you want me to do. He begins to excuse himself. Samuel says, Saul, why didn't you obey the voice of the Lord? Didn't you know that it was better to obey God than to sacrifice? Because Saul, his excuse was, look, I disobeyed what God told me to do because I brought all this stuff back to sacrifice to God. So he was excusing himself. In his own heart, he felt sincere about bringing these things back and offering them unto God. And God said, I told you not to do that. And so he began to excuse himself. And then from that time, he didn't take the discipline of God. He goes to Samuel, and instead of saying, okay, I repent, I'm sorry, he says, you know what, come on, Samuel, just kind of overlook this thing. Let's go and worship. Come on, I can still worship with you. Come on, let's go. That didn't make God happy. And so what happened here is Saul lost his kingship because of that. Listen to me, church. When God says no, and when God brings denial, and when God brings discipline, the worst thing we can do is just go on like nothing ever happened. Hello? And so here we find this was Saul's problem. He said, look, just overlook this thing. Really, don't, I, I don't want to have to deal with this thing. Let's just go on and worship God, and everything's going to be wonderful. And so you can see the different responses. How about in Acts chapter 8, verse 23. Remember Simeon? He was a man, he was a sorcerer in Acts chapter 8. And you'll read about this man. The apostles are doing miracles. They're healing the sick. People are getting baptized in the Holy Ghost. And this guy was, a, he was a... Uh, 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 stooped or bound rather in sorcery um, and he was used to having the supernatural power of the devil but he got saved um, but he still had a problem because the apostles were doing miracles and he comes to them and in the sincerity of his heart he says you know what I want this I want to be able to lay hands on I want to be able to lay hands on people and see them fill with the Holy Ghost I don't know if you know to you and I would say man that's a great desire hallelujah he says, give me this. And, and what the text implies is that he wanted to buy the Holy Spirit from these men. And so in his heart, um, uh, Peter looks at him uh, and he says these words in verse 23. He says, for I see that you are poisoned uh, by bitterness and bound by iniquity. He rebuked him. Because here's Simeon. He had a desire, a sincere desire. I want to see people baptized in the Holy Ghost. And Peter said, uh, may your money perish with you and your wickedness. And Simeon is probably going, whoa, wait a minute. What are you? Just wanted to baptize people in the Holy Ghost. He said, because I see in you that you're bound by bitterness and you're bound by iniquity because this man was bitter because he had lost his, what he had and he was trying to buy something. And in the depths of his heart, his sincerity was, was covering his bitterness and Peter rebuked him. He was denied the ministry of the Holy Spirit because his heart was not right. The Bible says he was full of bitterness. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 10. How many of you know this is easy for us to get involved with this morning? The heart knows its own bitterness, and a stranger does not share its joy. Verse 11. The house of the wicked will be overthrown, but the tent of the upright will flourish. See, what I'm getting at this morning is this. You and I as Christians, you need to be able to take a licking and keep on ticking. 
See, Simeon couldn't take a lick and he took off. He couldn't take any discipline. He couldn't take anything in his life. He just kind of, oh, you made me feel bad, and he ran away. Remember Jesus rebuked Peter? Most people in the church today would backslide and rather go to hell than take that discipline. Peter said, oh, I'll never do that. And Jesus said, get behind me, you devil. Whoa. He said, get behind me, Satan. He wasn't looking off into space when he said he was looking eye to eye to Peter. You know he was. He said, get behind me, Satan. And Peter gets rebuked and, you know, he probably felt bad for a minute, but he survived it. And he went on and, and he did something for God. But see, most Christians this morning, hallelujah, today that we live around, um, they would rather bail out before they receive discipline from God. They will bail out on God before they receive a word from God that says, No, I don't want you doing this. Most believers today, um, how many of you know we're in this feely, touchy generation, if you know what I mean? And everybody, everything has to be soft and, and everything has to be palatable. Everything has to be soft and able to swallow. Jesus didn't work with people like that, church. The disciples didn't work like that. Here's Peter and he tells Simeon, he tells him, you know what? You are full of bitterness and you're full of iniquity and may your money perish with you. Whoa. Now today we say, oh, that pastor has no love. Pastor Peter, he just has no love. Hello. Jesus turns and rebukes Peter. What are you going to say? Jesus had no love? Hello. No, Jesus showed his love. He laid his life down for these men. He laid his life down for us. But you and I, listen, we're involved with a generation that is just a bunch of spoiled brats, if you will. Can you say amen? They've never known, most people today in the church, they've never known what it means to get bent over your father's knee and have Hallelujah. Because they don't discipline them. Oh, we won't love them if we discipline them. You're in direct violation of the word of God. And you're, you're killing children when you don't bring discipline on them. I'm not talking about bringing out your baseball bat every two hours and thumping them over the head. Talking about bringing some restraints and discipline. Now, listen, to most people, the church is your last chance. Because in our life, in my life, I didn't receive discipline. When I grew up, I didn't receive discipline from my dad. Nobody told me what to do. I did my own thing or I'd slap your lips off, one or the other. Hello. And most of us had the same attitude. Just get out of my face. Don't tell me what to do. I don't care if it's my football coach. Um, you know, I don't care if it's my soccer coach, um, basketball coach, my dad. Um, you're not going to tell me what to do because this is my life. I'll do whatever I want. So you come to church and you're a spoiled brat. <laughs> and you've manipulated your parents all your life. Um, and you've conned your way out of this and that. And you've talked your way out of this and that. And so you've never received discipline. You've always been able to skate like a greased pig out of the hands of discipline. But friend, you'll never be able to go anywhere with God um, unless you get the grease off you and let God get, your ha get his hands on you. Can you say amen? What a startling thing it was for me to come to church and have God discipline me. Because I got saved and, you know, inside of me, everything was saying, get out of here, run, split, get out. How many of you know what I mean? Huh? Get out of here. You don't have to take this. This is too hard. Huh? They didn't need to say that to you. Your pastor was wrong. Huh? He was wrong. Your brother was wrong. God, you're wrong. Get out of here. I'm leaving. Because he didn't make me feel good. And it was a horrifying thing to me, man, when I came to the reality, you know what? I got to stay put. Hello? I got to stay here and take it like a man. You get these big tough guys, and then when God disciplines them, they're, <laughs> and they're running away. Hello. But I'm bad, you see, I'm bad. You know, nowadays you speak the truth to your brothers and sisters, and they throw a temper tantrum. All you do is you preach a sermon on truth, and, and it happens. People leave here totally flaming mad. Amen. Have you ever left the service totally uncomfortable and God has gotten under your case, on your case? You think, my God, why do you have to preach that? I'm not going to do that. You know exactly what I'm talking about. You sit in those seats because I sat there and I watch your faces and I've been where you're at. 
and your pastor's preaching or an evangelist is preaching and God is dealing with you on an issue and you're saying, I am not going to do that. Ooh. You won't take the discipline of God. I'll, I'll leave before I do that. I'll backslide before I do that. Ooh, I'll stop going to church. I'll find another church to go to before I do that. How many of you know what I mean? Have you ever acted like that before? And then afterwards you go, man, what did I do? You know, you, you, you're just in a conversation of, or you're in a church service and the truth gets spoken of, and all of a sudden that brother or sister gives everybody the cold shoulder for the next month and a half, two or three months down the road because truth got into them and they didn't like what they heard. Now they're going to get mad at everybody because of it. It's a little temper tantrum. You know why? Because the scripture is true where we live in a generation and if you were honest you'd be able to examine this and see what I'm talking about where people want touchy-feely teachers and people that can really minister to them and rub them the right way and make them feel nice and you know we're not out to be belligerent pigs and obnoxious just for the sake of being obnoxious you know what I'm talking about but when you preach truth it, cross, it goes across what we want and what people want today is they want these soft, palatable dissertations on your own desires. The be happy attitudes. Hello. See, the visitation of a man this morning is the ultimate test of character. I want you to hear me. This is so important. I, had, I have got to deal with this in my own life. I've had to do it, especially as a young disciple in the church, is that when the man of God came to me and told me no. See, Nathan went to David and told him, God told me to tell you no about this certain thing. And you know what? David went through with flying colors, didn't he? But most people don't do what David did. See, the true test of where we stand... And, is from the visitation of a man. See, we can, we can say yes, God, and we can say amen when God tells me no. When I'm in prayer, it's one thing, but when a man of God comes and tells me no, it's a total other story. When Peter told Simeon no, when Jesus told Peter no, and when Paul told Peter no, you can go through the scripture after scripture after scripture where a man of God came and said, look, the direction of your life is wrong. You're doing the wrong thing. You need to stop. You need to go the other direction. You're about to kill yourself. They said, no, I'm not. I don't have to receive this. Who do you think you are? Who, you're just a preacher. We're paying you for crying out loud. You, Hello? See, this is why many people, I remember in our mother church, I remember talking to people, disgruntled people all the time. They're, they're afraid of Pastor Rob. I mean, you know, Pastor Rob, this preacher Sunday. Now, is he is somebody to be afraid of? Hello? Well, you know, people used to come up to me all the time. I don't like to talk to Pastor Rob because I'm, I'm afraid of him. I'm, I'm afraid of him, you know, and, I, and, and I'm afraid of him and I'm afraid of his wife and I'm afraid of, I'm afraid. And I used to say, what are you afraid of? What has he done to you? Well, he's not really done anything to me. I'm just afraid to talk to him. I, I'm afraid he's going to chew my head off and spit me out. And I'm afraid he's going to, you know. No, 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 no. That's not the issue. The issue is, is he's been pushing that button in preaching and counseling and they don't want to hear the truth anymore so they won't go to him. That's why, friends, you should not avoid men of God. You shouldn't avoid your brothers and sisters. Can you say amen? Because this is where truth is this morning in the midst of the congregation. You know, you have a lot of people say, oh, I don't know. You don't understand my, my condition. You don't understand it. I don't like it here anymore. And so, I, you know, I'm, I'm moving on. Well, you know, the amazing thing is it works for everybody else. How come it doesn't work for you? Can you say Amen. I'm going to close real quickly this morning with the confidence that you and I have. Because David always let God choose his future. See, he never tried to take his future for himself. In other words, his own desires didn't rule him. He let God choose his future. There were many years in between the time when David, uh, Samuel came and anointed him as king and to the time when he was actually enthroned his king. There were many, many years. But David didn't try and do things himself. He didn't try and do, have his own desires in the way. He let God de decide and choose his future for him. Verse 19. Listen to him right here. 
The Bible says, O Lord, for your servant's sake and according to your own heart, you have done all this greatness in making known all of these great things. Listen, in other words, David let God choose his future. David let God choose for him and work for him. And a disciple of Jesus Christ this morning lets God choose his future. He doesn't do his own will. He doesn't go his own way. He lets God choose. Can you say amen? You say, well, what am I supposed to do? Just sit back and wait for a lightning bolt from heaven to tell me no? You know what I'm talking about this morning. Between the will of God, there's a vast difference between the will of God and our will. And how many of you know behind every no, there's a greater yes? When God tells you no, listen, God told David, he said no. David had grand desires. He wanted to do something for God. And he said, I'm going to build you a house. And God said no. How many of you know that must have been disheartening to David? Man, what do you mean no? This is what I want to do. This is what I want to do with my life. And so God said, no, 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 no. But listen, behind that no was a greater yes uh, because he told David, um, he said, look, I'm going to build you a house. Hallelujah. So you don't build me anything. I'm going to build you something. And this house is going to last forever. And you're going to have eternity with me. And he was talking about eternity to David because behind, behind every no, there's a greater yes. Uh, and we get so discouraged. Uh, and we get so um, uh, uptight. And we get so mad uh, when God tells us no. But friends, listen to me. He tells you no because he's got a greater yes down the road for you. Oh, I don't understand why pastor told me I couldn't do that. I don't understand why God told me I couldn't do that. Friends, listen to me. God knows the end of a matter. And when he says no, he has something else in mind for your life. He's not trying to rip you off. Can someone say amen? And the issue a lot of times is can we sacrifice our earthly future for his eternal one? Without having this problem of resentment and bitterness... Because of his yes. Listen, when God tells you no, it's so easy to start feeling resentment about serving God. Man, why did I even start serving God anyway? You begin to get resentful, you know, and you're not even happy to be saved anymore. You know what I mean? You just, you're mad that your husband's saved. You're mad that your wife is saved. You're mad that your kids are saved. You're mad at God. You're mad about going to church. You're just resentful. You know why? Because God denied you somewhere down the road. And this is easy to slip into. See, serving God doesn't make people bitter and frustrated and restless. Do you understand that this morning? Serving God doesn't make us bitter people. Some people think, well, if I go all out for God, it's going to ruin me. It's going to destroy me. It's going to kill me. I'm going to get frustrated. I'm going to be restless. I'm going to be wore out. I'm going to burn out. You know what burns you out? And you know what brings bitterness and frustration? When you don't obey His voice. See, you're doing all this sacrificing to God. You're, you're bringing the thousands of rams and you're bringing in the thousands of rivers of oil and you're doing all these things, up, but there's no obedience to the voice of God. That's where the frustration comes in. Jesus said in Matthew 11, Come to me, all of you who labor and are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke. His yoke is talking about his will and the disciplines of his will upon you. And learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And Jesus is saying here, if you would do his will and obey his will and take on the yoke of God, there is rest for your soul. The will of God does not burn you out. The will of God does not make you a frustrated and a restless person. Jesus said, if you come and take this yoke upon you, you'll have rest. And if you will disobey the voice of God, you're going to be a heavy laden Christian. Heavy burden and Christ and serving Christ is a heavy thing. There's rest and there's confidence in obeying His will for our lives. How many of you know we're called to please God this morning? This is a calling. If you're wondering what your calling is this morning in life, you're called to please God. You and I are called to please Him. Isn't that simple revelation this morning? You're called to be pleasing to God. God made us for a purpose this morning, um, and that purpose in life um, is to please God in whatever capacity that might be, but our life is to be pleasing to Him. And the way that we please Him is when we obey His purpose for our lives. Colossians 1.10, this is Paul's prayer. He said that we may be fully pleasing to God in our walk with Him. Romans 12, um, 1 and 2. The Bible says these words. It says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, 
holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Listen to these words. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable or pleasing and perfect will of God. See, this is what we're called to this morning. We are called to prove. That means to test. That means to seek out and to discover what God wants you to do that will be pleasing to Him. What is your purpose in Christianity? What is your purpose in living for God? What is the direction of your life? Why are you here this morning? Why do you go to church? What are you doing? Why? What's your direction? What's the purpose? What is pleasing to God for your own life? That's why so many times uh, you can hear uh, people preach uh, sermons about you're going to be an evangelist uh, or you're going to be a pastor or you're going to be a teacher or you're going to be a prophet or you're going to be this and there's all kinds of ministries and so we hear all these things and we go after them like crazy, don't we? Everybody goes this way and everybody's trying to be an evangelist or everybody's trying to be a pastor or everybody's trying to be a whatever God you know brings through the message and you find yourself totally frustrated at the end of you're seeking this thing out and seeking this thing out and seeking this thing out. You're trying to sacrifice, but God is speaking to you. You need to obey His voice. Because when you do His will, friend, uh, it doesn't matter. All those other things can be sincere. How many of you know the thrust of the church is winning souls? Uh, The thrust of the church is evangelism. But what is the will of God for your personal life? Because that's where the rest comes from. Most people, they get frustrated and burn out because they're trying to fulfill a role that God has not called them to fulfill. That's not an excuse for not witnessing in that because we understand that we're supposed to witness wherever we're at, you know, and given the opportunity, we share Christ and we're a testimony. But it's possible this morning to be sincere in our desire to serve God and yet be full of frustration and bitterness. And the reason for that is what I just said because our mind says, yes, we want to be pleasing to God, yet it's not lived out in our experience with Christ. See, how many of you know it's different to say, yes, I want to be pleasing, and then, yes, pleasing in your walk with God. Finding out what pleases God. You know what takes time? David sat before God. David sat before Him. And, friends, it takes time to get before God and find out what pleases Him for your life. Can you say amen? You know, we're always praying, God, you know, enlarge my bank account. God, uh, kill this sister that said that to me. And, God, do this. And, God, and we, you know, Paul was always praying about what was pleasing to God. God, what pleases you? Help these people to know what pleases you. And if you and I are going to know what pleases Him for your life, you're going to have to spend time before the throne of grace, seeking God, talking to God. Because how many of you know God will tell you what pleases Him? See, there's many today that have the God is on my side view of Christianity. In other words, they come to Christ and now they think, you know, I can do everything.